gig with about this many people. For those of you at home, this is a small bedroom. Mm -hmm. But it was a thousand seat thing, so it seemed like <laughs> <laughs> This feels like a thousand people in here. Yeah. Oh, yay! Yeah. Yeah. For New York, this isn't actually that small. <laughs> 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 Um, so what I learned at that, that gig where it was a thousand seater and there were only a few people in there was that um, things aren't always what they seem. And I remember I found a napkin on one of the seats and uh, some guy had drawn some stuff around string theory on there in the fourth dimension and he came up to me afterwards and he was just like, yeah, did you know your show has been transmitted into like another dimension? <laughs> and so, I don't know, man, I, I didn't know that. And so I know anytime there's, we're, we're working with like music and sound, it kind of goes back to the beginning of time. And like, I'm a big believer in, this is just like the tip of the iceberg. You know, we use like 3% of our brain. I'm not really sure what's going on here. It's bigger than, than what's here. And so I know like when, when we come into the world, there's certain promises that we make. Sometimes we don't even know these, these specific promises. And so for me, there were certain promises made between my mo mother and my father. My, my father moved my mother after they they married to a really small, low-income housing project squeezed between two trailer parks in the capital of the Confederacy, uh, Richmond, Virginia. And he promised her that he wouldn't raise my sisters and I as rednecks. Um, <laughs> that promise manifested in the way that we were gifted things throughout our lives, for birthdays and also for, for uh, Hanukkah and different, other different events. And so, for instance, um, I was continually disappointed with and so, <laughs> at the age of seven, when I wanted nothing more than the Atari 2600, for some of you that remember this, it was a cross between uh, a paneled, um, what was it, remember that car, wood paneling on the side, station wagon, wood paneled station wagon, and a kind of virtual burrito. I, I promised myself if I didn't get that gift for my birthday that I would run away and I made a list of the spices I would need and I put drinks in my canteen. I woke up the next morning for my birthday and there was a box, the exact same size and shape as the Atari 2600, <laughs> and inside it was, can you guess what it might be? A sweater. No, it Not was an electric very. typewriter. Oh. Oh. Just said, yeah. oh. Yeah. No, 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 I mean, the Atari 2600, which was the predecessor to the, um, you know, the, the Xbox was kind of about that size, so. Um, so my father was giving me gifts that would always make me into this cultured young man rather than give me things that would satisfy my needs as a kid. Later on, when I turned 11, I wanted the album uh, Working Class Dogs by Rick Springfield. Oh, yeah, I love and, and had the song on there, um, Jesse's Girl. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I hoped one day to have my own sales relationship. My father, for that, for that birthday, got me an album. Once again, the exact same size and shape as what I wanted. And inside was the album Double Fantasy, John Lennon and Yoko. Yeah. I hated them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no gift was as big of a disappointment as when I turned eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember that morning that I woke up, and there beside the washer and dryer in our kitchen, where there had been an empty space, there was a rickety green looking sculpture that kind of leaned to the side, like the leaning tower of what I call the leaning tower of pizza. And I remember I walked in the kitchen that day, and just so you know that during this phase of my father's artistic career, I was, ra I was raised by eight artists, and during this phase of my father's artistic career, he was making sculptures out of roadkill in Los Angeles to support us. He was taking taxidermy classes, and he would come home on his motorcycle with dead animals slung across his motorcycle, um, Tasmanian devils, cougars, werewolves, and beside the, the um, washer and dryer, there was a door that went down to the basement, which, where, which was where his studio was. He kept the little animal popsicles in the freezer down there, and he had huge bread baking ovens down there. And when it was time, he would take these animals to his taxidermy class, and he'd re reconfigure them with bread bodies. And so a typical sculpture might have the head of a turtle, the body of pumpernickel, and the <laughs> legs of a lizard. And every, about every three months, we would take these sculptures up to the Wyman Gallery in Chicago, and whatever didn't sell, we'd bring back home. And so most of the sculptures would end up in the backyard, but oftentimes they would wind up inside the house. And so our backyard sort of looked like a cross between a Wonder Bread thrift store and a Joseph Mingler petting zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and so seeing this weird looking leaning thing in that corner wasn't such a far-fetched thing that I would think it was a sculpture. And so I looked at it that morning on my birthday, um, just turning eight, and I said, what's that? And my father looked at me and said, it's a piano. You play it. And my father's a good old boy from West Virginia. And I looked at it and I touched it and a little bit of the the green paint flaked off on the on the floor, and I said, it doesn't look like it works. 
And he said, you think I'd buy a piano that didn't work? <laughs> and I looked at him, and I looked at the piano, and I said, pianos are for girls. He said, what's the difference anyway? You play all that girly music and wear that girly makeup. And it's true, from the age of about seven to the age of 11, I wore girls makeup um, <laughs> almost every day. Um, I was obsessed with the rock band Kiss, and I would dress as Peter oh. Chris. Oh. Awesome. He was the drummer for, for Kiss, and he looked like a cat, and he had black circles on his eyes, white face, and two um, whiskers right here. And so I had to promise the school that I would only dress up like Peter Chris uh, on weekends. And so I made that promise to my family. So that's what my father was referring to when he said, I wear the girly makeup and listen to that girly music. And I looked at my father, and I said, it's classic rock music. And he said, it doesn't matter. And now, just to give you a visual about the conversation that's about to take place, I'm dressed as Peter Chris as an eight-year-old right now. <laughs> <laughs> My father, typically at that time, was dressed in remnants of his roadkill, which he made into his own clothing. He had a big black beard and a huge white man perm. And so this made him sort of look like a cross between Ringo Starr and Daniel Boone. Um, now, my mom liked my dad's hair so much that she went out and got a white man from herself. She was like, a four-foot tall version of me. They're in the kitchen. My mom's from France. My dad's from West Virginia. She's Jewish. I'm, uh, and he's like Catholic, which makes me a, a cashew. Or otherwise, <laughs> otherwise known as a matzo pizza. Which <laughs> and so it kind of gives you a visual of what's taking place there. One other thing, an important plot point for this story that I'll just mention is the month before my father... My mother and father only drove motorcycles. And my mom drove a scooter, my dad drove a motorcycle until I was about 12 years old. My father got shot by a hitchhiker that he picked up on his motorcycle the month before, and so he's on crutches. That's an important plot point in the story. So I look at him and I say, it's classic rock music, referring to rock band Kiss. And my mom looks at me and says, and my mom has a, a southern accent, but she's from France, and she also was raised with the kind of the Yiddish twin story. That's the idea of her. And she says, No, Stoshtafa, if anyone can make this piano sing, I think it's you. And I said, A piano can't sing. Mm -hmm. And she says, I have faith in you. And my father goes down to the studio and he slams the door and he goes, What does an eight year old need with faith? And then my mom gets her scooter helmet and rides off to teach Sunday school classes. I go into my room and I remove the kiss makeup. And during the next few hours, leading up to my birthday dinner that night, I move into the piano. I take a sheet and tie it, it's, a, it's an upright piano, there's two columns on it, and I take the two ends of the sheet and tie it to the two columns of the piano, and I string it over um, one of the kitchen chairs, and I bring in my reel-to-reel -reel recorder, which I recorded absolutely everything during those days, and I plug it into the wall beside the piano, beside the um, washer and dryer. I bring in my um, Kiss Love Gun album, which <laughs> features the band, the four band members on the front, and 11 girls, which if you do the calculation, that's like a, like almost like three and a quarter girls for each guy. It's <laughs> exciting for a boy to think about this kind of mathematical <laughs> um, And I bring him part of my bicentennial Pepsi bottle collection in there. And I, I go into my little piano apartment, and I rewind my real career recorder to my favorite uh, made-for-TV movie. It's Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Opera, which is the band battles. Uh, the band battles an evil inventor in an amusement park, and it has all my favorite songs on it. But one in particular was my favorite out of all others, which was the um, song that Peter Chris sang. It was the, the ballad, Beth. Mm -hmm. um, Beth, I hear you calling. And it's about, um, you know, a guy in a band that can't come home to his girlfriend because he's busy at band practice here in New York. And so my birthday comes and goes. I've gotten that present late that night, the birthday night. Um, I sneak out of the piano, my piano apartment, and I sit in the chair. And I spread my fingers over the piano. And right before I begin to play, sometime after midnight, words begin to appear over my hands. Now, the word, um, the word power appears over this one. And then the word love appears over this one. And before I even play, I th I, it's like I think I'm like seeing things. I push down on, on two keys, one with each finger. And the words get brighter. Power, love. And then I take the finger on this hand and I lower it down to one of the black keys. And the word abundance appears over that hand. And again, I think I'm looking soon because I think I'm going to be going crazy or, or this piano is going mad here. And then I move it again to another combination of keys and the word sadness appears over it. And then I just take my hand and start bouncing all over the piano like a trampoline. And about 
Three seconds go by, my dad comes into the, to the kitchen limping on his crutch, and he goes, it's two in the morning, and then my mom comes in behind him, and I let my hands fall on my lap, and I hold my breath, and I squint my eyes, and I get totally silent. My father looks at me and says, what are you doing, boy? And I don't say a word, and then my mother comes in, and she says, he gets this from you, Michael. And my dad says, he gets it from your bohemian father. And my grandfather was a dancer at the Moulin Rouge and was just like my mother. My mom married a version of my grandfather. And my dad says again, it's two in the morning. And I sneak back into my piano apartment and everyone goes to bed. Well, as an artist, I think my father knew that I needed to eventually kind of uh, refine this kind of in, uh, relationship I had with the piano. Over the next few weeks, I began to document hundreds of these emotion note combinations in my mold screen sketchbook. And what I would do is I would draw 10 lines on a page and then I'd put black dots on the lines to represent the, the keyboard. And then I might put under one of the un, under one of these like emotion note combinations the word funny 13. And it would remind me of the way my uncle wore his like Daisy Dukes too short. And he had like <laughs> the equivalent of uh, you know what the, the male equivalent of uh, camel toe, which is moose knuckle. <laughs> and so later, when I opened that book and turned to that page, twenty thirteen, I could press the right combination. I think I think about my uncle, twenty thirteen. I just started laughing, or I might, and I documented hundreds of these emotion note combinations. There was sadness ten, and anxiety twelve, and there was confusion three. And about a three weeks went by, and I think my father knew that I needed to refine some of this some of this type of uh, my relationship that I have with the piano. So he tells me to get my stuff. My stuff is usually my motorcycle helmet, my sketchbook. And we grab his motor, we get on his motorcycle. And I have no idea how he's going to uh, drive his motorcycle with crutches, but he does. And within minutes, we're on I-95 going south towards Petersburg. We get off at the first exit, and we stop the motorcycle in front of a house, which looks like the color of a yellow russet potato. And uh, even from outside, it, it smells like french fries. And we begin to walk up to the door, and, and I, I don't know where we're going or, or why we're there. And my father asked me to, to give him my motorcycle helmet, and I do. And he knocks on the door, and after a few minutes, a tall black woman with a miniature beard on her chin, with a, her hair in her bun, a little bit of gray hair, answers the door and looks at my father and says, Mr. Coleman? And my father looks at her and says, Mrs. Tyler? And then um, she looks at me and she goes, Now sometimes with the little ones, they don't take to the lesson quite well, so you best be coming back in 25 minutes. <laughs> and my father turns around and leaves. And I follow Mrs. Tyler through the house that smells more and more like french fries as we go along. It's like a french fry floor and french fry wallpaper. And, and there's a, room, a dark room with a french fry lamp and a french fry rocking chair. And, it looks like a French fried piano, and she tells me to sit at the piano on the bench. And I hand her my my sketchbook, and she takes it, sets it on top of the piano, and she looks at me and she goes, "Do you play?" And I nod my head, and she says, "Well, go on in." And I sit in the rocking chair behind her. The French fry. She sits in the rocking chair behind me, the French fried rocking chair, and I keep my hands in my lap. And I look at her, and I look at my sketchbook, and I look at her, and I said, "Ma'am, if it's all the same to you, I'd like to learn what's in my sketchbook." And I take my sketchbook and I hand it to her, and she opens it up, and her eyes get big. It, it, it's like I, she's just witnessed something that's sexual and slightly erotic and illegal. And she slams it and puts it on top of the on top of the piano. And she goes, "I want you to play like this." And she runs her fingers up and down the um, the piano. She's playing a scale, and it sounds like they're running up and down a set of stairs. And she goes, "Now you go on and do what I've done." And as she removes her hand, her hand brushes me. It smells like French fries as well. She sits in a rocking chair and she's rocked back and forth. And I look back at her and I look at the piano, I look at my sketchbook, and I spread my fingers across the piano keys. And two words appear across my hands expectation equals love. And I know that this is the great artistic dilemma that I've heard my father and his artist friends talk about in the studio for years the, the artist and the young man the older conservative teacher, the idea of, of something forbidden leading to freedom, and freedom leading to artistic expression. And so I leave my hands there, and those words get brighter. Expectation equals love. And she looks at me, and she goes, go on now and just play then. And the more that I wait, 
the more she expects, the more love is love I feel like wash over me a little bit. And so I just sit there. And as the grandfather clock ticks, I finally hear my father pull up on the motorcycle outside, and we get up and we go to the war. I don't play. For the next 12 weeks, the lessons go exactly like that. I show up, she expects something from me, and the more she expects, the more I feel love. And during that time, I learned to play the Peter Chris song specifically by ear, and I, begin, and I continued to document my emotion note combinations in my sketchbook. So as far as my parents knew, I was learning to play the piano. Well, on the, on the 12th week, Mrs. Tyler showed up in the door. She opened the door before I could even go in. She looks at my father and she goes, Mr. Coleman, they may teach piano students how to be better students where you come from, but I don't know why they teach piano students how to become better players when they don't press the key. If it's all the same to me, this musical arrangement is over. I'm a sinner for greed for taking your money. She slammed the door. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we, I got on my dad's bike, we got to the first stoplight, and he looked back at me and he said, why wouldn't you play for that woman, Chief? And I looked at him and I said, Dad, she just wanted me to play what all the other kids play. She didn't want to teach me what was in, really in my head. And he never asked me again. About a month went by, and we got on his motorcycle again, this time on a Thursday night. And we showed up at another house. And as we were walking to the house, he asked me to hand him his helmet, and he, I looked at him and I said, are you taking me to a therapist's house? <laughs> he rang the doorbell, and a tall black man with a big afro and a green disco shirt with his with the buttons buttoned unbuttoned to here not uh, opened the door. He slapped my father's hand and he said, "You work in the program?" And my father said, "Yeah, I work in the program." And he looked at me and he said, "What's cracking, cracker?" And I didn't know what that meant, so I got my hands by my side, and he said, "Lenny." And then he put out his hand, which was his name, but I didn't know that either. And my father said, shake his hand, chief. And I held out my hand. He slapped my hand. And then he looked at me and goes, your old man tells me you're grouse on the keys. And I didn't know what that meant either. And we followed him into the house. And the house had this overwhelming smell of incense. And we followed him through the house. And we went downstairs into a paneled basement. And there was an entire rock band spread out in the basement. My father went up to each of the guys and then, then he said, this is, Len this is Eddie, Freddie, and Scotty. And they all looked like Lenny. They had big afros. They were black. They had disco shirts on that were unbuttoned. And then he looked at me and he goes, boys, this is the fella starts the phonies. His father said he's grouse on the keys. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about. My dad said, play your song, Chief. And there was a big keyboard stack over there. And I tried to walk over there, but I tripped over one of the cords. And so Lenny picked me up and put me on a stool that rotated. And I spread my fingers across these the keyboard keys. And the words that appeared over my both fingers this time were power equals abundance. And I took a deep breath in and began to play that Peter Chris song that I play. You call her, and I can't come home right now. And as I began to play, the rest of the band joined in, and Lenny began to sing. And after six minutes, I was the youngest member a band called Many Incline and Cosmic Rewinds. <laughs> <laughs> Every Thursday night for the next year, my father would drive me over to Lenny's, and Lenny became my mentor. He began to teach me about my emotion note combinations in my book. They were called chords, and he wasn't afraid of them. In fact, he told me the truth about chords and the power that they had over girls. <laughs> Almost a year later to the date when I received that piano for my birthday, I was going on stage with my bandmates to pick up a trophy at the Bells Road Holiday Inn Battle of the Bands who were playing the song, Kit, uh, the, the song Beth by, by Peter Chris. And I remember afterwards, we picked up the trophy and we sat in the booth, and I was in my own disco shirt with a plum-colored members-only jacket. And we were, we were surrounded by these really elderly women in their late 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like eight time. And I remember thinking, in that moment that I finally understood that this, this, uh, this promise that my father had made to my, my mother about not raising me to be uh, some uncultured kid had been a promise that, that was going to affect me for the rest of my life, and especially now that I had a, my own relationship to music, it would influence me in ways that I could only ever 